Hi, my name is Tommy Twilight. I'm the founding co-director of the Florence Poet Society, and uh, I'd like to read you a few poems. I'd like to start out with some new work. This is a poem about seahorses. Crushed by the ignorance of the world, still we dance the blue dance of love. Invisible currents, electric to the sky, fall like raindrops quivering. We float above all this gray in the blue, blue sea. We are a spectrum of light all our own, you and me. Um, I grew a garden this year. I think it's going to be the last garden I ever grow because there was a drought. We had to try and water it every day. It just wasn't doing well. The bugs, the chipmunks, and the woodchuck. So, Woodchuck, this is for you. Die, Woodchuck, die. May your teeth grow and puncture your jawbone with fatal results. May your fat, undulating body rot in the summer sun. May you choke on every lettuce leaf, every pepper that you took one bite from and left on the vine, every red tomato that you ruined with your foul breath every kale and bean plant and parsley that you mowed down with impunity. May your guts explode with the bounty of my efforts. May your smug visage feel the wrath of my curse. You thieving, treacherous bastard. You parasitic dirtbag. You mock me with your arrogance. May you suffer eternity, stinking in hell with the others of your kind. Die, woodchuck, die. Okay, um, about a month ago, uh, I lost my mom, and she, uh, you know, it was peaceful for her. She was 82 years old. She got to see great-grandchildren. We were able to care for her at home, uh, my father with the help of, you know, hospice and, and with me living across the street and stuff. But um, shortly before she passed, I wrote this poem for her. It's called White Harvest at Dawn. In mom's backyard, and I haven't even had my coffee yet. I bend with the knife in the dew and dust to pluck the thrust of spears reaching up, buds packed tight, almost purple in the half light. And I remember Grandma Stella by starlight in her dirty shoes, half as worn as her feet, her whiskey cigarettes, her sailor's breath and old Grandpa Joe with his suicide knob and triple X and all the cookies and green soda pop from Harmony Springs and ice cream sandwiches in the barn where they kept the tomatoes. And you could smell the earth on their clothes, in their bones. It was different then. And we were warned not to go down to the river, but we didn't listen. And old Joe made sure that mom had a new green bike for her 11th birthday because green was her favorite color. And with the war, it was hard to find. And Joe picked up some extra money at the shipyard. But eventually the asbestos and the pesticides and the fertilizer and the Paul Malls killed him before he was 65. But that's okay, because he never would have taken a vacation anyways and Stella by starlight became a legend in her wheelchair and all the sailors came around to hear her curse and mom is going to join them along with Tomas and Uncle Buck just as soon as she decides it's time. Everything starts with blue, a splash of paint on an old barn board, like a sign that says there should be color here and nothing else. But then you look again and you see the worn fingers of the farmer who pulled rocks from fields that are now forest and a barn that was raised up by his neighbors 
long gone, and the weathered remains of gray skies etched into the knots and grain of a pine tree that stood a hundred feet tall and was once a sapling that grew in a clearing where native children played in the sun and imagined themselves hunters and warriors as they fell asleep to the stories of their elders in the moonlight by the fire. My neighbor um, is really uh, a garden person and she loves her garden and uh, I wrote this for her. And this particular poem was published in the um, 30 Poems in November Anthology, which is a local uh, fundraising effort for the Center for New Americans. And this year, I am the chairperson for that event. So I'd like to read this poem uh, to help uh, publicize that event and publicize that anthology. And it's called Garden Girl. She throws some seeds at the garden digs her toes into the dirt. She says to wait, and then she coaxes the rain with her eyes before the sun shines on her face. She smiles, the flowers grow, tomatoes turn red and gold. She plucks them with her fingers, sea salt on her lips, tomato juice down her chin. I think this piece uh, speaks for itself here. Uh, it's a story poem, a narrative type of poem, and uh, it's a little longer than some of the other ones, but uh, let's give it a whirl. It's called A Bible and a Loaded Gun. My friend and I were out walking. He said, all you need in this life is a Bible and a loaded gun. And then he showed me his 44, King James Version. It gleamed in the sun. I load it with silver bullets, he said, just like the Lone Ranger, just in case I meet any vampires. My friend is a little nuts. He has seven pairs of underwear, one Bible, and 365 guns. He is a collector, and his collection is awesome. Every day it is something different. Tomorrow is his birthday. He'll probably pull out his favorite Glock. It was a gift from his late wife, the first one, the one who killed herself. I still miss her, he said. On Sundays, my friend likes to get up early and read his Bible. Then he'll go down to Joe's diner for some scrambled eggs and ham. After that, he likes to clean his M1 carbine. Just feels good in his hands like an old friend. I might be lonely, but I'm never alone, he says. If it's a nice day, he'll throw it over his shoulder and stroll the back roads outside of town. Like he was 21 again, back in Korea. Most of his buddies are gone now. In fact, he might be the last one. Last he heard, Sammy had liver cancer and John John was blind. Jesus, John John was a character, he muses. After taps, he'd drink soju by the glass and then climb up to the highest tree outside of camp. He'd stay up there all night like a monkey. At dawn, you'd hear him squeezing off rounds if he saw stuff moving around in the woods. That guy had eyes like an eagle. We all slept a lot sounder because of John John. My friend's Bible is worn. He's had it since the fourth grade Sunday school. When he got it, it had his name engraved on the cover. Now the leather is so worn, you can't read his name no more. The pages are yellow and falling out, and the cover is held on with duct tape. There is a hole where the O in Holy Bible is. It's a bullet hole. The bullet went through the Bible into my friend's rib. It hurt a lot and cracked his rib, but my friend was okay. Thank God I had my Bible with me, he said. It slowed that bullet down just enough. We walk on a bit more. I tell my friend I don't much like guns. Mostly, I can take or leave the Bible, too. This bothers him some, because these things mean a great deal to him. But he doesn't say much about it, because I'm his friend. He figures I have a right to my opinions, as long as I respect his. 
We reach the top of the ridge and look out over the valley. My friend is a little out of breath. We just stand there quiet for a while. The view is sublime. The river wanders through a patchwork of fields. The setting sun exquisite in repose. My friend deftly rolls himself a cigarette, lights it up, and takes a deep drag. Ah, oh, Jesus, that tastes good, he says as he exhales. I tell him I've been sober for three years today. My friend says, that's good, son. I've been praying for you the whole time. I guess poetry is a lot about, uh, it's either death and dying, or, or love, or sex, or something like that. But this one here is for a friend of mine who um, uh, used to play guitar with us. And he was a young man, I think he was only 36, and uh, his, we called him the Shredder. And this poem is called Reaper Down. Reaper Down. What to believe at the end of standing so many years, to explode in smithereens only to fall without sound or witness. Look out over these fields. Know the highway that goes and goes and never stops. Know the cold wind that rustles oak leaves in a death rattle. It is music to me, and I crave your comet and your blade. Remember how we cut the ribbon marking you for slaughter? Remember the vines that held you back? Remember too what you meant to us with your dog familiar at heel. In these shreds and splintered limbs that yesterday stood, I now release your soul to that same cold wind and I see the sign of how powerful you've become. All right, I think I'll lighten it up a little bit here. This one, um, you know, there's the heavenly angels that are like up here and they're, uh, you know, so holy and, and, and beautiful and uh, so good. And then there's my kind of angels and those are the dirty angels that live down here with us. So this one's called Dirty Angels. My angels live in the dirt. And the deeper they go, the more beautiful they get. They are the fallen angels. They are not stuck up like their cousins, the heavenly angels. They are dirty angels, earthy, body, raw. They tell jokes and play tricks on one another. But it's all in good fun. They know how to party. They drink nectar and dance all night under toadstools to the violins of crickets and the songs of peepers, tree frogs. Then they sleep all day waiting for sunset before they wake up and have their breakfast of pollen and evening dew. They enjoy raucous sex and lounge in hot tubs made from the upside down caps of acorns. They are like us, except they don't have a lot of uptight rules, like who can sleep with whom, or whether or not someone can smoke dried flowers. After all, they were banished to this earth just like we were, and they are stuck here too. But they seem to know to actually how to, they seem to actually know how to have a good time and not worry about it. We can't see them, but dogs and cats and little kids can. My angels don't care if you eat meat or burn gasoline. They know that soon enough we will all be food for the worms or fertilizer for the trees. And someday, maybe, we will be reborn as robins and fly. My angels are not gluten-free, but they won't hurt you. My angels don't have wings, but they know how to laugh, especially at themselves. And when they cry, sometimes they do, the lightning bugs gather up their tears to add sparkle to the night. We could sure learn a few things from my dirty angels. 
like how to forgive each other, how to relax and love each other, and how to live every day as best as we can as we spin through space on this weary old earth at a thousand miles an hour. Okay, um, keeping with the lighter sort of side of things, I have a little poem for you, and uh, this is inspired by my work uh, with the fire department and uh, with working with women and men together. And uh, we have several women firefighters, and um, I think they're amazing. And they mostly come into it from the paramedic side of things. So they don't usually start out as firefighters, but they learn the job and they start doing it. And um, one of my old uh, friends that uh, actually injured herself and now she's no longer a firefighter, but she uh, said to me, she gave me the first line of this poem. And so I'll read it and you'll, you'll kind of know what I'm talking about. The poem is called The Big Heads. Jenny said, the main problem working with all guys was the size of their heads. I never thought of it before, but it makes perfect sense. There's my friend John. Everybody calls him the squash. His head is like a blue Hubbard, three feet across. Misshapen, lumpy, and blue. Thick, hard, and heavy, too. His head is huge. And then there's Martin. His head's a potato pockmarked and brown. He ain't no tomato, a head mighty and massive, and so is his crown. He is the king of the heads on the south side of town. Then there's the chief. What about the chief? His head is a mountain bigger than a hill, more impressive than a fountain. How he has the will to carry it or get through the door, I'll never know. But his head is especially large, that's for sure. Now take Zippy. His head is a hot air balloon. Not much inside, but look at all that room. When his head is puffed up to its full amazing size, you can be sure that it's Zippy as he floats through the sky. Then there's Mac and Bob and Dennis and Gazoo. Their heads are pretty freaking bloated too. Like great gas giants in a solar system of heads, they spin through the universe too big for their beds. I'm sure you've dealt like guys, dealt with guys like this before. If you've lived on Easter Island or in Washington or New York, pig-headed guys with great heads of pork. But believe it or not, they're living here too because my head just might be bigger than you. I have a thing for blue herons. And um, when the, the meadows downtown in, in the when the Meadows area floods in the spring, I like to take my kayak out and visit the Heron Rookery out there. I'm not going to tell you exactly where it is, but um, it's quite an amazing thing to see these, these dinosaur birds flying around and just to spend a few minutes in that world. And this poem uh, speaks to that a little bit. It's called Blue Without Regret. Water sucks back into the earth behind crystal glass. Skewed, haphazard ice clung to muck and tree knots. Fragile, strange. It was cold, colder than the day before when sun and blue stretched across this dirt road meadow covering all in pools. Vernal, temporal, it was rain. I felt failure then pain in my arm, locked load in my head. I could have rode this river through trees all the way to rookery on wingspan greater than man, on platform high with twigs spittle and downy sides, egg tooth chipping away sky, falling in flakes across her feathers. I was beautiful then, covered in fine fuzz and flame, all open mouth cry. What she offered, I took and wanted more. I was scandal of beast, prehistoric, hungry, always hungry, bald, 
big-eyed, three-toed witness to the field, to the river, to the trees. I claim the sky, the endless, lonely sky is my own. I know no glory, no fame, no time. Hard gaze unblinking through uncorrupted yellow eyes. Deadly beams to pierce the heart unsuspecting with my thrust. Poised, patient, on one leg standing, waiting to strike. Yet again and again I miss the mark. I say no prayer, feel nothing. My bones hollow tubes. I could die standing here without regret. Should my chance come again, I may yet take my place with the others of my kind. Feed on this fish blood, this cold scale flesh. Then I will survive. Then I will live. Um, I would say that this one is in a similar vein to that in some ways. And um, I think of this poem as uh, a, a journey. And it's, uh, it travels across time a little bit, and it's, it speaks to a more primitive time. It's called Skin. I stretch this madness across broken screw heads in your frame. I scrape the hide clean, but leave the hair on. This should make things easier for you to understand. The skin will make a fine drum head or a skin boat. The ocean is cold. This I know without knowing. Both of us can fit if you crawl inside. All I need is my harpoon and paddle. I can take you across. The ice is not my problem. Look at the colors I bring. May it satisfy your need. The log is hollow. I can smooth it out with fire and oil. My hand is made of bone. The sound will carry us across the water. I pull the lashings taut, gut after gut, twisted and tied. There is nothing left to do except scrape with my hard stone. My hand makes all of these things. From these offerings I take, I will beat my drum through the long night. The dreaming will not cease. I will sing without inhibition. The dance will continue until every star is obliterated, until the ocean is dry. You may take your pleasure then, for all of this is for you. Take this taste and take this fire. Let it be as you wish. One. For one moment, he controlled the rain. In those few lonely seconds, between the flash of light and the low rumble of sky, he split the time and space between them into raindrops that fell on the world in great sheets blown on the wind. The rain fell against tomorrow. There was no stopping it. All of the yesterdays were washed away. Droplets splattered by the millions, by the gazillions, countless individuals with heartbeats of dust sacrificing themselves against window panes and rooftops, in fields and trees and mountains, beating everything senseless with their drum patter of wetness and song of cleansing breath. She was waiting by the sea. She was the sea. The moon pulled at her tides and the sun glistened on her waters. She was everything he'd ever wanted. This terrible beauty of life and the vast hypnetis of her blue-green glory. She'd been waiting a long time. She knew they would come together. The raindrops would trickle down in rivulets of tears, ripple and plop into the puddles at play, fill the gutters and streams with a rushing torrent, and flow into her. All she had to do was wait. He would come to her, and in that moment, they would be one. My broken butterfly is nothing but a lie to you. But to me, this tiny tear in the universe is everything. The masters of her presence rub the powder from her wings.
with my fingers. Oh my God, I cannot fly. I cannot fly. The End of Land, Part 1. Discs split out infinite, so round to cup so many. A bird would drink your water in glasses of tendril green and gold charms. Lucky for you, you came today. Clotted up with the jarred fragrance of orange citrus, jasmine, and stink. Nobody knows the rubber stem, the way they pluck out tubular brown, but we are way past that. The bugs drive us away. The rain spray splats my ink to the secret pond of beech forest where it's almost impossible to move. If I were a bird Jesus, it would be a cross, something nailed against the cement sky. If I were a frog prince, I would not wish to become man, but rule this kingdom for life. In wisdom I would reign. It's not sand, it's wet texture modified to shift in form. It's not the splash of fish or the breeze that lightly splays the leaves of scrub oak and bonsai edge. It's not the ripple that moves the static dark in smooth little circles. I don't know what she said. I was listening to the warble of goat birds, the slow dance of turtle fish and the gnarled choke of pine. I am so smooth here, dense with no silence. She runs on in air without limit, blip bouncing up and down, not still. There is a flutter leaf, moving like deer, cut off from flat bone. And what? What is that whale-shaped cloud? Okay, this is a Golfing with Whitman 2. Uh, there is a Golfing with Whitman 1 also, but this is Golfing with Whitman 2. He revels in the pointlessness of it. The fact that the purpose of the game is to play as little as possible. He dreams of small white balls rolling into cups on manicured carpets of green. Strides fairways lanky and lean, his countenance resolute and pure, his cap rakishly cocked, sun flashing on his back swing with the distinct swoosh of a reaper scythe mowing down hundreds, maybe thousands of leaves of grass. With every sweet stroke, his every motion a majesty of beauty and form in hickory shaft and sinew. Oh, death! more random than birth. For everyone born of two, there is but one to die. O oh, wickedness of slice and fade, let my drive be true, avoiding the traps and snares of my ineptitude. Let me be a murder, an arrow of deliverance, a beam of sun that cuts straight and true through the clouds of darkness to the flag unfurled and waiting. O oh, miracle, my goal is the perfection of one perfect shot, to clear the lake soaring with the grace of an eagle, the precision of a surgeon, the accuracy of a marksman, whose bullet splits the hair like a barber with his finely stropped razor. For my destiny is distance on a par I cannot see, across a forest of tall trees and grasslands of green, a quest I can only dream, for the beauty of my tiny, insignificant hole in this good, gracious earth. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to read this poem for my son Tomas, and this poem is called Siglio Bende. Road worn, fat pink, mint green buses from the 50s, belch black smoke that dissipates all the way up Goyeneche, tasting it as you get it. Scrap cardboard in the windshield, a hand-lettered black magic sign that says taxi, ready and willing to take you to tomorrow for some paper play money, while the smiling, dog-eared Jesus smokes hand-rolled cigars and prays on the dashboard, an altar to all that is good and ungood. Statuettes of divas, 
devils and dreams, snuffed out stubs of cigarettes, blood red beads hang glistening in the sun, short white candles of rose and orange. A quick glance in the rear view mirror, the driver signs himself, indigenous hands grip the wheel without looking back, beep beep, we're off. Vamanos, no mas tiempo, tail fin American iron icons still rove, Traffic snarls on these tight, stony streets, now ancient, worn-out hulks of style, pushed aside by ubiquitous Toyotas, pickups, and flatbeds, jammed SRO with metismos, empleados, campesinos, low pastel buildings with carved Spanish doors, locked tight against the din, in hidden courtyards, an oasis of fruit and flowers three meters from madness. The olfactory overload from diesel, dog crap, cactus flower, sweat, high heat, longing, hunger, no hope, bone cancer, faith and love, stoic and unbowed, in defiance of odds, so great, so high and wild, so remote that resignation seems like salvation. The fruit vendor pushes his cart to the corner, calling out, Platinos! Naharanyas, Platanos, to the street that spins in slow motion like a punch drunk bantam who swings roundhouse up on his toes. Yeah, you know the one. The ballerina who floats in time. The single oak leaf cluster that catches the lightest air. A magic carpet flying back and forth to and fro until it comes to rest temporary here on this earth to the words painted huge on signs of glory, proclaiming tires, TVs, tiendas, abogados, loans, repairs, cantinas with Coca-Cola, cervezas and Dumbo, the little elephant with the big ears looking for his mother. I close my eyes. Red energy laces through my eyelids as we careen down streets made for sandals and donkey carts, built by Quechuas and Aymaras who masticate their coca leaf chew with lime. A native god that grants them the fortitude withstand the hunger and high altitude, the bone crunching labor and unyielding rays of dirt and sweat and disrespect for who they are and all they once were. Their women twirl barefoot at night around small glowing campfires fueled by scraps of paper, bits of wood and trash. Their colorful woolens, woolen skirts hoop up, fan embers and sparks that pop and crackle and shoot through the darkness. The drunken beat of goat skin drums propels their dancing, their brown feet worn, beautiful, filthy with grace. Their men play on as long as the chicha lasts. Their children doze as music and voices grow distant to the fields of sheep whose intermittent bleats and baas break the silence of llamas who spit and stare into the universe of stars with huge brown almond eyes that cannot cry. Aka, que? Siglio bende. Asi? Si, si. Car stops at the gate. A medieval guillotine raised up by thick clinking chain links the size of footballs, where green soldiers with machine guns watch cautiously, take turns smoking cigarettes with cupped hands. You cannot take their picture or any pictures. They will confiscate and smash your camera or worse. This is a prison. A castle wall as far as you can see, a gray stone fortress 20 feet high, 10 feet thick, tiny windows with iron bars dot the towers, a small sign that reads Siglio Bende, painted in plain black letters, hangs on a wooden board. Near the gate, people mill about. They step over the dead man slouched against the wall. His open mouth and blank, empty eyes, oblivious to the flies that buzzle his ears and nostrils. He could be 50 or 35 or even 70 years old. No one knows. Color his hands. 
he may as well be a broken pop bottle, a dried up puddle of vomit, a wet spot on the crotch of his trousers, given up here and dirty because no one looks at him, even ignoring the stench that will be the test later on. Inside the gate to the right is the old prison. You can look through the bars, still see prisoners walking an oval path worn in unlikely grass. They wait for relatives to bring them food and water, for the guards bring them nothing. To the left is Siglio Bende, anything for sale, aisle after aisle of open market stalls, thousands of vendors closed in walls bigger than five football fields. Colorful tarps flap against the sun-drenched sky. Where do I begin? I walk toward the far wall. I've got no idea where I'm going. I don't know what I want. The wind rustles jetsam into a dust devil, miniature, momentary, a universe unto itself, a tornado with human eyes, and an old story. Ant people move about, carry purpose like water, Small brown men in suits and ties hustle goods and change money. Dirty dark boys shine leather shoes for Yankee coima. Stout women with Andean faces, ruddy in bowler hats, softened by threadbare alpaca pullovers, safety pins and beads, smile, gold tooth chattering in groups of three, Inca gold, gold for glory hidden from conquistadors in those bloody days of old, now caps the teeth of these barefoot cholitas. I stick out like the gringo giant I am, wander stunned and aimless through the maze of red Chinese batteries, symbols no one understands, plastic and stainless steel bottles, baby products, pulpy diapers labeled pompo, handwoven cloth in intricate colored patterns, car parts, industrial machines, consumer goods, watches, razors, anything electronic, film, cameras, several stalls of cane flutes and reed pan pipes, followed by row after row of guitars and charangos, and then a single booth of handmade wooden planes and chisels. These tools catch my eye. I know I will never see them again. Quanto, tres mil. La hoja es bueno, no? Si, sí, duro, nippon, excelente. But I have my doubts about the blade. The wood is beautiful, however, close-grained, light brown, workmanship sublime, hand-carved horn smooth in my hand. Dos mil? Siete por tres, todo. Bien. I look at the match set of three and agree. He smiles. He will have food and drink tonight. His front tooth glistens gold through his salt and pepper mustache. He's an artisan. His eyes belie a sadness behind tinted glass. Without words, I admire his hands, his ingenuity, his skill. He tips his hat, and I move on. The wind is idle now. The afternoon sun turns lazy toward a slow horizon. It seems I remember there is one thing I am still looking for, a distinct smell of something powerful yet distant, wafts and whiffs across the market. I cannot place it as I continue. It grows stronger, more frequent. I would get away from it if I could, no matter. The crowd carries me forward. I cannot move against them. A broken stick in the river catches on shoreline rocks and releases back into current over and again, turning and spinning inevitable to the sea, to the incessant sulfurous rot of seabed muck, of earth blood primeval, brown and red, scooped up by God in handfuls and breathed into man. I'm looking for a soul, a small brown soul to carry with me. I will give time without, I will give weeping, I will ask nothing. I will pray. I'm willing to pay to make any sacrifice necessary to hold him. I know I'm getting close. I hear the chopping block before I turn the corner. The stench staggers me dazed, dizzy from too much sun. I see the butchers work on long enameled tables, dried wet with blood, slippery underneath their boots, 
Carcasses selected and weighed hang like carnival prizes overhead. The flies have a field day as desperation sweats off the last rays of sun sinking behind the high wall, bringing cold shadow. I ask for my son. Siglio Bende. Anything for sale. It's been a long day. Afterwards, I follow the crowd to the gate. I hold on to him like home. So my uh, Facebook friend, Juan Felipe Herrera, the U.S. Poet Laureate, says 30 poems in November brings 30,000 inspirations in all our lives. I'm the chairperson this year for the Center for New Americans fundraiser, 30 poems in November. So I would invite you to go to the Center for New Americans webpage and either participate as a poet who writes 30 poems in November or to sponsor a poet that you know who's writing and participating in this event. And our goal is to raise some money for Center for New Americans, which provides English classes and logistical support for uh, new immigrants to this country. It's a wonderful thing. We've been doing it for eight years. It's been very successful. And my job as chairperson this year is to try and build on that success and continue it. So I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you. This is Silkworm the annual review of the Florence Poet Society. Uh, we've been doing it for eight years now. This is edition number eight. And edition number nine, we expect to be out in November. Um, it's something that the Florence Poet Society solicits poems from around the area, from members of the Florence Poet Society, and anyone can submit to it. We get poems from, I think this year we have a couple poems from even from like Saudi Arabia and Europe. So it's a good book. It'll be available at, uh, also at Off the Common Books and at Collective Copies. So I recommend that you check it out. So these are my two latest chapbooks, True Lies of Love and uh, Fifteen Rivers. And uh, if you go to the Florence Poet Society webpage, you can find out how to contact me and get, a, get your own, very own copy of either one of these chapbooks. And there are also several other ones available, but these are the two latest ones, True Lies of Love and Fifteen Rivers.